morning we're going to recite the opening of the sutra verse and then I'll offer a short talk. All response? The Dharma is vast and subtle. The Dharma is vast and subtle. We now have a chance to see this. We now have a chance to see this. Study this and practice this. Study this and practice this. Reciting of this sutra to the great bodhisattva named Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra is the bodhisattva of great activity. And these uh, bodhisattvas or enlightened beings, we can think of not just as beings, but as qualities that are that manifest in the world in one way or the other. And each of us has the quality of activity or action or really virtuous action. So I want to dedicate this, this talk to Samantabhadra. The other name for Samantabhadra is universally good. And may this Bodhisattva help us find a way to correct action, to good act, universally good action in the world. There are, there are all kinds of books that we can read. There's fiction books, all, all kinds of genre. There's fiction, and the Avatam Saka Sutra is not a, a fiction book. There's nonfiction, and uh, the Avatam Saka Sutra is also not exactly nonfiction. It's not, it contains some fictitious stories. It contains some, um, I don't, I don't want to call it nonfiction either. While it has some bit of science and math in it, it's not a book about science or math. It's, uh, while it has some uh, elements of, say, a romance, there's some elements there. In it, but of course, it's not a it's not a romance book. It has some elements of mythology, but it's not mythical. mythical. It's not a fantasy. Some people might think of some parts of it as a horror book. <laughs> Just a little, bit, a little bit. But it's not a horror. It's not a horror book. It's not, it's not exactly self-help. It's, it's not children's literature. It, um, it's not, it, it has some of these elements of science. When I was first introduced to the, the book, maybe, I want to say 1999, my teacher, showed me this, this, uh, this book, and I said, wow, this is huge, this is a thick book. I'm used to chanting a one-line, like a one-page sutra, like the Heart Sutra, and this is, this is 1,600, roughly 1,600 pages. Oh, I'm never going to get through this thing, and I, mm -hmm. and, I, and I still haven't. I've just been slowly chewing on it over the past couple of decades. And uh, when, I first, when I first read it, I was just... I didn't know why I loved it so much, but I just did. And as I'm uh, reading it more and more, I feel a, such an affinity with this sutra. There's something about it when, when I read it, something in, inside of my own heart and mind shifts, something inside my own heart and mind changes. And I think it can be a very, very powerful um, sutra. If we take it literally, uh, we won't get very far with it. It's just too, there's some fantastic elements to it. It ignites the imagination, which can be very, very healthy for us to, to help us to shift out of, out, of our, uh, out of our unuseful mental scripts that create more suffering for us in our life. 
if you want to change your mental script, this is the place to go. Any of any sutra is the place to go, but this one really addresses some very deep aspects of our mind. Can I ask what does Avatamsaka mean? The flower, one, one translation is the flower ornament sutra. In Chinese, it's referred to as Hua Yan. Hua is Hua Yan. But it means the flower ornament sutra or scripture. Yeah. I love the name Avatam Saka. There's something very powerful about that name. What's this name? So I would like to share with you about the uh, read from the chapter on the 10 acceptances of the Bodhisattva. And I want to give you a little bit more background on this, this sutra. I came across, thanks to one of my colleagues, I came across another book about the Avatamsaka Sutra recently called Universal Enlightenment. And there's it just got some wonderful stuff in it to help us understand this, get our minds wrapped around or to organize the sutra because it's just so big. And the author mentions that there are, uh, there's in, within the Avatamsaka Sutra, there's a kind of trin trinity. It has its own trinity. Now I say that word trinity and that might bring to mind something that you don't <laughs> maybe just uh, disagree with or something. And this trinity, this Buddhist uh, trinity is not something that you have to believe in. It's not something you have to profess your faith in. It is a, it's describing qualities of being. And there are three qualities. These three qualities are embodied in particular beings. Whether they're real or true beings, I, it doesn't bother me if you think of them as true or real. And it doesn't bother me if you don't think of them literally as true or real. That's not the point. Um, but there are three. And the three are, these, these names, maybe some of you have heard these names, Vairochana is the, the number one, Vairochana, I'll, I'll talk about him in just a moment. Manjushri is the other one. And Samantavadra is the third one. So. Uh, Vairochana. Vairochana is the symbol of the of the Buddha. We I mentioned at the start of our service this morning we have these three gems, three jewels that we bow to, and and whenever we are we're acknowledging these three jewels, they're real jewels. You, know, you can you can uh, hold these jewels and feel their, their um, value, their value. You can even go to the store and trade them in for any goods that you want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we value things though, right? It's like, can I trade it for something? This is a different kind of value. It's, a, it's, it's our own value. So it's, it's your worth. It's what you're worth. So the first one is Vairochana, and Vairochana is the cosmic Buddha, what we call the cosmic Buddha, or the complete reality, physical reality, everything that's physical reality, the, the galaxy, the stars, the solar system, this earth, every, every bit of physical reality. And the Vairo, Vairochana is, is here to help us to have faith in your Buddha nature, your Buddha, each of us. This is, a, this is a foundational premise of this sutra is that each of us has Buddha nature. What is Buddha nature? Buddha nature, our own innate wisdom and, and, and compassion, the ability to wake up to our own wisdom and compassion. Each of us has that. There's a saying that only Buddha, only Buddha can, uh, only a Buddha with a Buddha. We are Buddhas because there are Buddhas. It's kind of a circular way of thinking. There's a, there's a, uh, one of Dogen's fascicles is called Buddha together with Buddha. We practice, when we're practicing meditation, we're never practicing it alone. 
my teacher would say we should practice as though the Buddha was sitting right next to us behind a soji screen. Practice with that in, in mind. How would you sit if you knew the Buddha was right here in our midst? That's the kind of attention we want to, to give to our practice. Yui Butsu, Yo Butsu. Only Buddha together with the Buddha. So Vairochana is not just the physical universe, but also part of our own mind, heart mind. And Vairochana reminds us that there's this, there's no division between subject and object, between self and other. We create, create these artificial boundaries uh, between self and other. And when we really come to practice meditation, those boundaries start to dissolve. It's not that we shouldn't have boundaries. We need them for our own self-preservation, but there's more to life than just self-preservation. Yes, can you imagine if you lived your whole life out of, self, out of a sense of self-preservation, you would constantly living out of fear, that kind of a fear-based approach to life. We need, we need to set boundaries for important reasons, but there's something, uh, there's a deeper truth there that's always present, and that is that we are all manifestations of the one. We're, we're all manifestations of the one. We come up, we pop up in different forms here and there, like waves on the ocean, but each wave is the ocean. You can't separate the wave from the ocean. That's just like you, and we're just in different manifestations of the, of the one. So the second, the second um, being is Mandrushri. Mandrushri is not a Buddha. Mandrushri is a Bodhisattva, an awakening being. And he has the quality of wisdom. He's often seated in a, in a you can see him depicted as a, an image in a meditation center. He rides a lion that never sleeps. He sits Sazen on top of the lion. And sometimes he's depicted carrying a sword in his hand, or maybe like a flaming sword that cut through delusion. That's, that's Manjushri. And it's not just any kind of wisdom, it's the what we call Byodo Chi. Byodo is the wisdom of equality, that all of us are equal. Right? All of it. There are certainly the differences that pop up here and there, but there is equal the wisdom of equality, recognizing as re recognizing all beings as our equals. The name of the temple where I trained, the Ch Japanese name for it, it was Byodo Zan Zendo, the uh, equanimous mountain <coughs> Zendo. There's lots of mountains in the area. And equity, if you think about equity, or there's a sense of, uh, or equality, there's a sense of, of flatness. So the image of the, the flatness and the, and the mountains, these are images for our practice too. The ups and downs of our life sometimes represent these, are represented by the mountains. But then there's also this equanimity present or possibly present. It's always there. It's always there, even in the ups and downs of life. And uh, Manjushri is about seeing through superficial appearances. We all get caught up in appearances. We like certain people. We don't like other people. We have our preferences. So Manjushri is to help us see through all those preferences and recognize the equality. There's no difference between a gold nugget, nugget and a clod of dirt. You can't go to the store and sell a clod of dirt. <laughs> It'll be good gold because we don't see that equality. Because we don't see that equality, we can't go into a store and trade in dirt or what its weight in gold would be. But for us, we can practice seeing in that way and know. Right? There is the, what we call the relative dimension and the ultimate dimension. The relative dimension, you got to have a certain amount of money in order to buy something. The ultimate dimension, everything's equal. 
we live in both worlds simultaneously. We can't ignore either, either one. One of the things that we need here is in order to, to activate this wisdom, this Yodo Chi, we need three things we need to study. We need to study it, what we're doing right now. When we're practicing meditation, we're studying it. When we're listening to a Dharma talk, we're studying it. We also need faith. This is an important piece, not faith in something external, but as a mental quality, faith or confidence would be another translation of that word, confidence. We need faith and we need to cultivate, which means we need to have repetition. We need to do this again and again. It's not good. We might get it now, but we forget it. We get it and then we forget it. And then we gotta get it again because we forget it. So we, we have to have a mind that is okay with repetition. This is really, you know, one of the reasons my teacher said she agreed to ordain me as a priest is because I had a background in competitive swimming. And with swimming, what you do is you go back and forth <laughs> in a pool, right? And you just keep doing flip turn, and you're just making a circle again and again and again and again. And when I first started swimming, I really didn't like it. I was quiet, you know, I don't have any body fat. When I was a little kid, I'm sitting there shivering, and blue lips, and my mother would say, Get back in the pool. <laughs> she was my first real Buddha te Buddhist teacher. <laughs> she didn't know it, but she was my first. And so I did, and then, you know, just to kept doing it. I just kept doing it. And something shifted, something changed around the age of 11. And I, and then, uh, okay. And when you, if you ever do any kind of sport or any kind of activity that requires repetition and practice again and again, let go of the time, let go of the clock time, and you keep doing it, and something shifts internally. The mind opens up, and a store of energy that we didn't realize that was present becomes present. When we sit in zazen again and again and again, just continue to recommit to the practice, something shifts for us. And I think of it as a very healthy kind of shift. We, we get access to parts of our, you know, as far as just the health aspects, when we're sitting upright and practicing sitting upright, the sternum you know, presses forward, the shoulders come down, the chin tucks just a little bit, and we're opening up those blood vessels in the back of the head. I, you know, if I have a headache and I sit down and I sit in the in the correct posture, those blood vessels open up and there's no headache. The headache goes. That's just me personally. Um, you know, but find these things out for yourself through the repetition. And this requires a faith or confidence in the practice, a faith or confidence in your own spine. On a physical level, it's so healthy to sit upright. Our postures in this culture are absolutely horrendous. And so many people with you know, these uh, sh uh, shrimp backs. And uh, we have this gift here where we practice exercising the muscles because there's specific muscles in the upper back that we're using, that we're engaging in order to sit upright. And you can practice that, you know, just feel them. It's not easy to do, especially for a prolonged period of time. So we practice it, lifting, lengthening the, the upper back up. It's not the low back. We want to be careful about the low back. The low back, we can press our sit bones down, lengthen the upper back, and, the, and there's a there's a there's a a softness, a pliability to the physical body. We want to engage with that fit that that pliability of the muscles, allowing them to be soft, and at the same time lengthening up. We open up our hearts, and on a physical level, this is wonderful for the heart. It has, you, know, you can breathe better. You're getting just a, you know, just a slight little shift in opening up the rib cage, and the oxygen goes a little bit more deep and gets a little bit higher up in the brain. When we're when we're scrunched over like so, just even just this little tiny bit, it makes you know it changes something. It's like a chimney flue that hasn't been cleaned out. The smoke just comes into the room, and the other. But when the chimney is the flu is clean, lengthen up, 
the, back, the spine is lengthened up in a way that is sustainable, right? So we have to make it the practice sustainable. If you're going to repeat it again and again and again, we want to make this sustainable. We want to make it enjoyable. It's got to be enjoyable. It has to be comfortable. You know? And we go to our limits with the practice. We go to our limits with our, our posture. And what happens when we keep going to our limits and then we rest, we go back to our limits and then we rest. And we can find through that practice, we can extend how long we sit comfortably. Right? So that's what we want to go to the edge of our comfort zone. Just maybe touch the discomfort for a little bit. And just like when I was swimming in uh, competitively, what happens to your lungs when you keep swimming? They expand. You can hold your breath longer. And it's not easy to hold your breath. Right? If you hold your breath for, if you're not used to holding your breath, you hold your breath for five seconds. Your lungs, you know, they, you might feel them burning. I remember one race that I did when I was 15, the first time doing 200 breaststroke. And I got in the water and uh, I was dying because you had to do this pull out at the end of each turn where you're underwater for a good five seconds or, or maybe longer. And by the fifth or sixth turn, my lungs were burning. I had to do seven turns altogether for a 200 yard um, event. And I remember my, and, and completing that. After I did that, I could do an underwater pullout for much longer without having that burning sensation. And I think practice is very similar. The longer that we sit, we're going to experience a kind of maybe burning. And it's clearing stuff out. It's clearing out our the karmic, our karmic uh, uh, negativities, maybe one way to think about it, or our physical toxins in the body. We're, we're burning them up. And so it may not be pleasant for some time. But if you stay with it, with the repetition, this is cultivation. And faith or confidence in yourself is inseparable from this desire for enlightenment. How to have that? We're all here because we have a desire for enlightenment. We may not put it in those words exactly, but that's that's a desire each of us have. What does that look like? Well, all of us are different. It's not going to look one thing like one thing. What does it look like for me? What does it look like for you? It's this, how do we live our life in a way that is in alignment with the, with the Tao, right? the, the, the course of the universe? So the third uh, figure here is Samantabhadra, and Samantabhadra rides the elephant. So you can imagine this great being riding an elephant. That's the power of the elephant. The elephant is symbolic of action, strength, power, <clears throat> and also steadiness. You don't see elephants, you know, they, the, the way they walk, they're majestic. So this is practice in action. This is Samantha Bhadra is the practice of the Bodhisattva. That we, we come to sit. And so these this three part, I, I think of the three parts here. Vairochana is this Buddha nature that we have. It's, it's kind of like the idea. We, we come with an idea. Manjushri is is having that confidence in ourselves, that confidence in that idea. You get, if you have an idea of what you want to do, that's the beginning. The second part is you have to believe in yourself that you can accomplish what you set out to do. And the third part is that you have to do it, right? One, two, three. Any action has those elements to it. And the more we refine our, the, our, our idea, our confidence, then the action is going to reflect that. Our actions will reflect that. Thich Nhat Hanh says something like, the quality of your doing depends on the quality of your being. And so when we're practicing zazen, we're developing a strong, positive quality of being. And then when we act from that place, it's going to be a different kind of acting. It's going to be more focused, to be more present, Samantha Bhadra is about making vows and then carrying them out, even if they're impossible. You don't have to worry if they're if you can carry them out successfully. It's not it's not about success or failure. It's just about doing it. You just do it. 
Now, one other thing I want to mention about the Avatam Saka Sutra before we get into some of these verses is um, uh, this one. So from this book I've been reading about it, uh, this one phrase stuck out to me. The, uh, the author says, for the Hua Yen or Avatam Saka school, the words of the sutra itself are, of course, the principal cause of enlightenment. Right? The words of the sutra itself are the principal cause of enlightenment. And in this respect, Hua Yen stands apart from, from most other forms of Buddhism. Buddhist tradition in general tends to regard the language with suspicion as a product of our dualistic consciousness and a perpetuator of delusion. That's really true. In the Zen world, we're very suspicious of words and letters of language. Language cuts things up, it divides for the most part. Um, and it insists that the ultimate truth can never be defined or expressed in words. That's true. Hua Yin, however, Hua Yin, however, is always rigorously non-dualistic and whole, acknowledging that all dharmas are merely created by language, at the same time also states that all dharmas are ultimately real. So there, we have this uh, expression of non-duality through language. Through language, we can experience non-duality. This is a gift of this, this uh, wonderful sutra. And I, you know, it's putting words to I, thoughts or feelings that I've had about it. How can a sutra express non-duality? The ten acceptances. The ten acceptances. Oftentimes when we think of acceptances with regards to practice, they have, they have this psychological tone to them such as accepting our, our self, right? Self-acceptance might be a, a way of thinking about acceptance. <clears throat> but this, this uh, sutra invites us to think way bigger than our personal psychology. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we need to have those other three qualities here in our minds when we're reading the sutra. The idea, the idea that we can attain enlightenment, the confidence in that idea, and the carrying out of it through practice. When we come to the, when we approach the sutra from that place, we, we can enter a doorway, I think, to open up our minds to what the Buddha experienced at his own enlightenment. That's what these words are. It's, they are said to be how the Buddha articulated him, his, his, uh, himself at the time of enlightenment. And when we read the words or listen to the words or recite the words, we are effectively undoing our negative mental scripts through the reading of the sutra. We're, we're undoing our me the mental scripts that don't work for us. Now, many of these chapters begin with a a long kind of introduction to it, describing the space where the Buddha is, or where a certain Bodhisattva is. And it goes into great detail of, of uh, the, the trees that are surrounding, the, the ground lined with gems and stones, the clouds of perfume and incense and all of this stuff. Uh, but interestingly, this particular chapter doesn't do that. It's one of the ones that doesn't do this. It kind of goes right into it, the ten acceptances. Then the great enlightening being universally good. So this is Samantabhadra. He says to the enlightening beings, offspring of Buddha, great enlightening beings have ten kinds of acceptance. Offspring, they even have this language, offspring of Buddha. We are all offspring of Buddha. It's one, one way to think of this. We are all offspring of Buddha. And so he's speaking to us, me and you. If you acquire these acceptances, you will manage, you will manage to arrive at the stage of unhindered acceptance. What are the 10? Don't you want to know? <laughs> 
They are acceptance of the voice of the teaching. That's number one. Conformative acceptance. Ooh, I'm not good at conformative. I don't want to conform to anything. <laughs> well, let's see what that one's about. Acceptance of non-origination of all things. There's one. Non-origination of all things. Acceptance of illusoriness. Acceptance of being mirage like. Acceptance of being dream like. <laughs> Acceptance of being echo like. Acceptance of being like a reflection. Acceptance of being phantom like. Acceptance of being space like. Imagine all those acceptances. These 10 acceptances have been expounded, are being expounded, and will be expounded by the Buddha of past, present, and future. Being expounded right this moment. What is great enlightening beings' acceptance of the voice of the teaching? It means when they hear the teachings expounded by the Buddhas, they are not startled or frightened. <laughs> Or overall. Yes, uh, somebody can leave themselves. They, they believe deeply, understand, appreciate, aim for, concentrate, concentrate on, remember, practice, and abide by them. This is this acceptance of the voice of the teachings. Number two, what is the great enlightening being's conformative acceptance? It means they contemplate the teaching investigate it, impartially conform to it without opposition. That's a tricky one. Conform to the teaching without opposition. What is this teaching? Wow, can we rest in, that's one teaching. Can we lengthen up our spine? That's one teaching. Can we find ease and peace in this moment? Comprehend it, purify their minds. That's a hard one. Purify, purify our minds. Live correctly by the teaching. Apply it. Enter into it and fulfill it. That's the number two. How about the third one? The acceptance of non-origination of things. Non-origination of things. All of us. We have a birth. Time when we were born and a date at that time. And at some point, we'll all have a death date. We'll get a death certificate. You won't get the death certificate. <laughs> <laughs> but we got the birth certificate. Yeah. Somebody else will get the death certificate. Yeah. I'm learning about this since my father's passing. But the Dharma is saying that there is actually, yeah, that's a truth, but there's also no origination and no destruction. Get your minds wrapped around that one. These great enlightening beings do not see that there is anything at all that originates, and do not see that there is anything at all that perishes. Why? If there is no origination, there is no perishing. If there is no perishing, there is no extinction. No extinction, they are free from defilements. If they are free from defilements, there is no differentiation. If there is no differentiation, remember wave and water, there is no location. There's no location. We think we're here. We're everywhere. We are the embodiment of everywhere. Think about where you came from. Your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, all of them. This is a, like an echo, are living in us. We are the result of them. Where did they come from? The East Coast, Europe, Ireland, Norway, Africa. Keep going back. Where do we come from? If there is no location, there is no quiescence. If there is no quiescence, there is no detachment from desire. 
Just listen to that. There is no detachment from desire. Mm -hmm. That should be liberating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have to be detached. From, we don't have to pretend like we're desireless. We have desire. There, if there is no detachment from desire, there is no doing. Another wonderful one. There is no doing. You think you do the do, but if we really practice closely and carefully, we see we're not doing anything. Even if we're sitting, if we, even if we're doing something, sitting still is not us sitting still. If there is no doing, there is no wish, no wish, no dwelling, no dwelling, no coming and no going. Uh, yet we think in terms of coming and going. This is saying there's no coming and no going. You don't have to understand this with your intelligence. Keep that in mind. It's trust in the practice, trust in the, trust in the teaching, trust in yourself. This is the, called the great enlightening being, the acceptance of non-origination of things. I want to go to one more. There's all of these, and they get longer and more interesting. Um, this is an opportunity for us to change the mental script, but I also, and, and I mentioned before the importance of cultivation and repetition, but I also recognize that we are limited in time and I don't want to mm -hmm. um, over -rep repeat myself here or go on and on. This is my, one of my ones that really hit me uh, the past few, few weeks. What is great enlightening being's acceptance of being dream-like? Do we see ourselves as being dream-like? Usually not. But this is saying it's a, you can accept being dream-like. Here, great enlightening beings know all worlds are like dreams. Just as dreams are neither of the world nor apart from the world, not of the realm of desire, not of the form, realm of form, not of the formless realm. Those are the three worlds. The world of desire, the world of form, and the formless world. Not arising, not disappearing, not defiled, not pure, and yet obviously manifest. In the same way do enlightening beings know all worlds to be like dreams, unchanging because of being free like dreams, because of clinging like dreams, because of being inherently connect, unconnected like dreams, because of being like the basic nature of dreams, because of being like visions and dreams, because of being undifferentiated like dreams, because of being like thoughts and dreams, because of being as when awakening from a dream. This is called great enlightening beings acceptance of being dreamlike. So I hope you got a nice taste, a good flavor of the Dharma here in the Abhidhamsaka Sutra. I would encourage you, we have two copies of this book here in the Nebraska Zen Center. I encourage you to take it off the shelf. There's one right here. It's got the, uh, the red hardback book. And I'd encourage you to open it to a random page and read it. There's affirmation of science in this book, of engineering. So happy to read that. Uh, math. Everything is practice. Don't think there's, you have to be super religious to do practice. That's nice, but everything is, pra is potentially can be seen as practice. We're offering a service to others. The next chapter in here is about calculations. And it goes into math. And it keeps, yeah, it's an amazing chapter. And it, it's, it's meant to, for, to help us approach infinity in the reading. We read it, and as we read it, our mind just can't hold on to it. And through the reading, we, we approach a sense of infinity. So anyways, um, I'm glad to introduce the chapter to, to you, or this uh, sutra to you, and I hope we can explore it here and there in uh, small doses. Thank you. Do you have time? We'll take questions. Yeah, please. Comments? So why is it called flower ornament sutra? Oh, <clears throat> well, almost every page you open up, it talks about 
<laughs> garlands of flowers and this and everything you know flower is a is a symbol for our own life just as a flower you know starts out as a seed and then grows and then you have the bud and then the enlightenment is symbol is the symbol of the opening of the flower the one of the disciples of the buddha is said to have been enlightened by seeing the the buddha hold up a flower for a dharma talk that's all he did he, he held up a flower and his his student mahakashapa smiled and in that moment there was a transmission between teacher and student um, so the flower is an important an important symbol in buddhist literature the sutras uh, each of us are flowers the whole world is full of flowers there's a wonderful book my teacher um, had me read one time it's called flowering earth it's an older one it must be like 50 years old or more by now maybe 80 years old called flowering earth you look it up it's got all of this scientific information put in, in um, by somebody who obviously loves deeply the, uh, the whole flowering earth. Flowers appeared on earth at a certain time in earth's history. Did you know that? There were, the earth didn't always have flowers, but now it does. Think about how could we live without them? The bees need, we, you know, they, we need the bees to pollinate the flowers, the flowers create fruit, it's just a wonderful, a wonderful metaphor for our practice. So if you see a flower, you can see a Buddha, right? These flowers up there on the altar is the, is the, man, is the Buddha. It's not a flower. <laughs> it's a flower, but it's also a Buddha. It's a, it's a practicing Buddha as itself. You don't have to see the Buddha in the flower. The flower is the Buddha. That's why we put flowers on the altar to remind us of that. So is the flower, um, closing up in the seasonal part of that? Absolutely, yeah. We don't hold on to anything. We, have, we go through a birth and a death. It's, a, it's another metaphor for this expansion and contraction of life. This is the breath, in, out. You can't have an in without an out. You can't have an enlightenment without a delusion. The two go hand in hand. Yeah, this won't this moment won't last forever, will it? <laughs> Anyone else? Thoughts? Questions? Anyone online have any questions? And welcome everybody. Dan, good to see you there. And uh, Joyce, Nabob, and uh, somebody else I don't recognize, but thank you for being here. Hey, good to see you, Dan. Thanks for practicing with us. Dan's, Dan's uh, zooming in from PA. I know him from uh, my, my uh, when I was in, living in Pennsylvania, training at the temple with my teacher. He would come frequently to practice with us. So I'm glad we can reconnect. Well, let's enjoy the next moment then.